We might just give it a minute or so just to um, let anyone attend. Well, I might um, I might start and then if people join as we go, that, that works as well, if that's all right. Um, so thank you everyone for um, attending tonight. I'm Jackie Hamwood. I'm the Research Project Manager at CIRA, so the Centre for Eye Research Australia. Um, and we're here today to discuss the clinical validation of artificial intelligence algorithms in healthcare. Um, so this is our 12th workshop. It's part of a series discussing artificial intelligence in healthcare from data to algorithm to real world solutions. These workshops are supported by the Medical Research Future Fund. And our goal is to connect the diverse skills of clinicians, researchers and healthcare workers with computer and AI scientists. Therefore, we're trying to get everyone working together to develop and build artificial intelligence solutions for real world healthcare challenges. So before we start, I would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the various lands on which we connect tonight via our computers and pay our respects, respects to their elders past and present. So without further ado, I will um, welcome Dr. Daniel Capuro. Um, he comes to us tonight from, as well, you are the senior lecturer in digital health in the School of Computing and Information Systems, as well as Deputy Director of the Centre for the Digital Transformation of Health, which are both at the University of Melbourne. So his main interest is in developing methods to improve the use of clinical data for research. This includes the use of electronic health records and the data collected in them using artificial intelligence to predict some diseases and complications and process mining to understand the best ways to organize care. So I'll pass over to Dr. Daniel Tapuri. Thank you for being here with us tonight. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much for having me here today. Um, I'm very excited about this, um, this opportunity. And just to tell you a little bit about myself. So I'm, I'm a medical doctor and general internist. And, and did my PhD in health informatics a few years ago. Um, so I, I use machine learning in my research projects and I collaborate with people that really know how to do machine learning. I'm the, the clinician who understands um, you know, enough to, to make it work. Um, and, and, and what we've been working on, especially in the last year and a half here at the University of Melbourne is sort of how to cross this, what we call the last mile. And there's a slide down, you know, in, in, in the deck that that is going to, you know, talk to that a little bit. Um, there's some, there's one video uh, in my slides. I shared my sound. So if when the video comes, you do not hear the sound, let me know, okay? There might not be much I can do to fix it, but at least I won't be showing you some silent movie. Um, again, this the, the 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 title of this talk is the last mile clinical validation of AI algorithms in healthcare. Um, so for today's discussion, uh, we're going to start by first um, describing a cautionary what we call a cautionary tale. Um, then we're going to go deeper in discussing this idea that evaluation needs to go beyond accuracy, and finally. Uh, nail down this idea of the last mile, okay? Um, normally in healthcare, we think of um, healthcare innovations as, you know, new drugs, new vaccines, new procedures, um, but more and more we realize that digital interventions are also part of the innovations that we have available. Okay, uh, and this is you know just to, a reminder, a smartphone reminder uh, to take my pills, to go to my you know yearly checkup, to um, to do my screening tests, to brush my teeth, you know whatever you want to call it. The digital interventions are also health interventions, and but we haven't thought about them 
like like regular interventions like pills, vaccines, procedures, and so on. Um, so again, that's what, what brings me to these cautionary tales. And I like this title, Cautionary Tales, because they're one of my favorite podcasts is what you see here on the right. It's called exactly like that, Cautionary Tales. At the bottom, there's a link. I have nothing to do with it. I just enjoy listening. And it talks about all our cognitive biases and how they influence our decision-making processes. And I think healthcare is full of them. So that's why I love this one. I'm gonna, and I'm gonna talk, um, show you this video. Hopefully it'll work. All right, do you see this YouTube video? Daniel, sorry, I'm yes? not sure you can change it, but your um, sharing panel is kind of through the middle of the screen. I don't know if you can- Oh, okay, let me, let me change it because I have a full screen version of it. Um, it's too hard, to, it's not that bad. I just thought- No, 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 but- Are you seeing a full screen now? Uh, yeah. All right, perfect. So, and if I click play, you should hear the sound, hopefully. Oh, of course it happened now. <laughs> uh, let me try again, second attempt. Let me make this bigger. Oh, too bad. Try one more, whoops, no. All right, I won't be able to show you the video, but you can look for it. It's, um, it's, um, it's a video on, if you search for this time travel dietitian, and it's about a, this video of this dietitian, which is the guy with the mustache here, uh, that goes back in time uh, and tells this man that's trying to eat breakfast that he shouldn't eat eggs because it's going to increase his risk of uh, suffering a heart attack. Then he goes, comes back five minutes later telling him, no, it's not the eggs, it's the beef. Then he comes back and it tells, it's not the beef, is the carbohydrates. And then he comes back and tells him again, it's not the carbohydrates, is your, the amount of exercise. And then he comes back again and tells him it's not any of that is genetics. So it's this idea that we keep changing our recommendations on what we should and shouldn't be doing in terms of healthcare. And that, um, and that is like the baseline for our, again, cautionary tale. So um, this is a story in, in, in the 90s, um, early 90s, Patients with an acute myocardial infarction, that's a heart attack, and ventricular extrasystoles, um, we realized that they were at a higher risk of dying in the hospital, okay? And there was this drug, the flecainide, that um, we knew it reduced ventricular extrasystoles. Um, and then flecainide became routinely prescribed to patients with an acute myocardial infarction to prevent these extrasystoles with the belief that it would prevent them from dying. Uh, but lo and behold, somebody then did a randomized controlled trial and they found that this drug actually increased other kinds of arrhythmias in these, in these patients and it actually increased mortality. So that's why we call it the anti-arrhythmic. -anti Okay, because it increased arrhythmias, contrary to what we thought was gonna happen, and it increased mortality. And then, but it took years to realize that this was going on. Um, the second one is this, um, whoops. Another example, patients with hypertension are at a higher risk of stroke, heart failure and death. And you know every clinician knows these things. And then we realized again, a telolol, a drug, 
that reduces blood pressure. So let's give patients with hypertension a Tylenol. And a Tylenol quickly became the standard of care for antihypertensive therapy. And again, somebody then did a huge randomized trial and then it found that a Tylenol was no better than placebo to reduce these events. Okay, so that's why you know I, I, I named that placebo versus placebo because we were running a trial where the drug was no better than placebo. And a third case um, is again that's a picture of a thyroid gland, um, a cartoon of a thyroid gland. Thyroid nodules can become malignant. Then we have a very cheap um, diagnostic tool like ultrasounds, neck ultrasounds are low, low cost, non-invasive diagnostic methods. So then let's implement a thyroid uh, cancer screening program to improve detection. And what happened uh, years down the road, and this is a, a, a chart showing what happened in South Korea, where you, saw, where you can see that after the program was implemented, you see a huge increase, you know, a many fold increase of the incidence of thyroid cancer. But when you look at the red curve, the mortality actually didn't really change, okay? So then we, we go back and think about, you know, what are we actually achieving with this diagnostic tool, neck ultrasounds, in detecting uh, thyroid cancer early, uh, but not actually getting any benefit. And, and even more, if you look at this gap, between the red and the blue lines, you can see that we are now labeling a bunch of people uh, as being uh, survivors of thyroid cancer, okay? Um, and then, you know, probably without too much or any benefit. So then my question is, do you see any patterns? And I know that um, you may not be able to interact with me here, but think about what's the pattern here? And I have the answer. So the, the pattern here that I showed you is, you know, identifying a clinical problem, in this case was increased mortality. It was uh, in, uh, high risk of stroke or heart failure and, you know, people dying of thyroid cancer. And then, you know, finding a biologically clinically plausible solution. Let's lower blood pressure. Let's give this antiarrhythmic drug. Let's find the tumors early. Okay, it's, it's plausible. And then thinking about intermediate or surrogate outcomes. And so what are, what were the surrogate outcomes? Reducing the number of ventricular extrasystoles, reducing the level of blood pressure, uh, increasing the number of nodules that I die of, you know, malignant or potentially malignant nodules that I find. And then implementing the solution without actually demonstrating the clinical benefit of my solution, okay? And we see this pattern over and over again in medicine, unfortunately. So we see that medicine is full of reversals. Okay, and here I have this person, you know, flipping pancakes because we flip, uh, sometimes we flip our opinions on what is and what isn't good for patients. And we don't want that, okay? That's not good for us uh, as a healthcare system. It reduces trust. We're harming patients uh, along that pathway. And digital interventions are no different. You know, even digital interventions, they could be a dashboard, it could be a patient facing an app, and it also could be an AI algorithm. So digital interventions are no different than traditional interventions, which is what we started with. And again, here you can see an example. Um, we know that patients can have an atrial fibrillation without knowing it. Atrial fibrillation is an arrhythmia of the heart. And it's an increased uh, risk of, of stroke, okay? Because they can form, uh, you know, a, thumb, a thrombus in the heart and thrombus can co go to the circulation and, 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 and block an artery and generate a stroke. Um, so, you know, somebody thought an algorithm can detect an atrial fibrillation from standard resolution videos. Let's create an app that allows patients to detect atrial fibrillation at home. And this is not science fiction. This is something that actually exists. 
And here, this is the, the, the paper. It was published in JAMA Cardiology. And here you can see in, you know, the output of the AI and it's classifying each individual based on how the volume of their faces changes over time, whether it's regular or irregular uh, based on the heartbeats and classifying patients, whether they have or don't have an atrial fibrillation and on top, you see the exact EKG trace that corresponds to the underlying you know, video image, okay? So again, this is happening and, and you know, the, the Apple Watch is uh, TGA approved in Australia to detect atrial fibrillation, okay? It's not, it's probably not an AI algorithm happening behind the scenes, it's a more rules-based, but again, we have algorithms that are being approved to detect you know, various conditions. But the question is, have we demos have we jumped into this pattern that I just described, or have we demonstrated the clinical benefit? So then what we discuss with researchers is, you know, but this is so accurate. My ROC curve, and I, I, I watched some of the videos of your previous uh, sessions in your seminars, um, and, and I'm assuming you're familiar with, with an ROC curve, you know, the closer to 1.0 that this ROC, R, the area under the ROC curve is, the better. So if you have a very good uh, classifier, then the ROC curve, the area under the ROC curve is gonna be closer to one. So if we say, you know, it's so accurate, so why wouldn't I use that, okay? And my first message for you today is that you need to remember and burn this into your retina since this is an eye research workshop, burn it into your retinas. Accuracy is a surrogate outcome, okay? Accuracy is a surrogate outcome. And it's important to, 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 to be aware that AI can have benefits, but just as any health intervention, drugs, devices, diagnostic tools, it can have risks, unintended consequences, and long-term effects, okay? Um, we're not gonna talk about the ethical issues around uh, AI applied in healthcare. But even if you know, we eliminate those, um, we, we still have the risk of generating, again, unintended outcomes, adverse outcomes to our patients and long-term effects. And I would say that the two key challenges for this last mile are the validation of AI algorithms in healthcare. And what I mean by validation is clinical validation of effectiveness and the implementation, okay? So we're gonna be discussing a little bit about these two things. So by clinical validation, um, we mean, you know, how do we know these things work, okay? How do we know they work? And, and again, this is not a novelty for healthcare interventions. We already know what we need to do to make sure that these things work. So again, how do we know they work? Think about what do we normally do to understand whether something in healthcare works? And probably the most straightforward answer is you run a randomized controlled trial, okay? You do a randomized controlled trial, you have a group of patients that meet your inclusion criteria and you randomly allocate them to the intervention versus the control, okay? And this could be a therapy. Again, it could be a vaccine. It could be a device. It could be a drug. But it can also be an AI-based diagnostic strategy or an AI-based screening strategy. And we need to do those studies because otherwise we won't be able to determine whether one strategy is better than the other. Is it using the AI better than not the AI? And the second important thing is we need to do studies with patient relevant outcomes. If we go back to the, the um, you know, the atenolol example, we have a patient with hypertension 
and we give them a drug to reduce their blood pressure. Think about, you know, put yourself inside the shoes of that patient. If I told you um, this drug is gonna lower your blood pressure, do you really care about that drug? And I'm gonna, this is sometimes it's, it's controversial when, when I say it, um, I would say, no, as a patient, you shouldn't care about that drug. Is it atenolol or any other drug? If what, if what it does it is lower your blood pressure, but the risk of you suffering a heart attack or a stroke or heart failure in 20 years uh, into the future, if that risk stays the same, you probably really don't care about the drug. What you care about is reducing these adverse events. You care about not being hospitalized for an acute myocardial infarction. You care about not having heart failure. You care about not having a stroke. You care about the risk of dying prematurely, okay? So again, when we're talking about patient relevant outcomes is what do patients really care, okay? And patients, we, we, I know that, and again, as a, as a clinician, we, we do tell patients, you know, measure your blood pressure, control your cholesterol, your blood glucose, and so on. Why? Because we know that they're in the causal chain, and we know that if your blood pressure is lower, then with, you know, very specific drugs, then you're going to live longer. Okay, but if the drug, the only thing it does is lower your blood pressure and does, don't change, it doesn't change the risk of these adverse events, then you don't really, you shouldn't really care about them. And, and, and going back to our um, initial message, accuracy is a surrogate outcome. That's very important. So if you tell a patient or a doctor, oh, this algorithm is super accurate. I, as a doctor, I shouldn't care. As a patient, they shouldn't care. We care about improving patient relevant outcomes, okay? So again, when we, and what we see now in terms of when, when, when we read in a paper, you know, validation of algorithms, we're gonna see things along these lines. So we have a population that has a certain condition, or that are, are, are at a risk of developing certain conditions. And we, you know, we divide our sample in the train and test subsamples. The train subsample, we use it to train our algorithm and then we test it in an unseen portion of that population. That's um, what we normally see in most machine learning applications, uh, publications in healthcare. We can even take it a little, a step further, um, and we can see in one population, we divide the, the sample into the train and validate samples, uh, and we train it and then validate and iteratively go back and forth um, to make sure we have a, you know, an, an algorithm that is robust enough, okay? And then we go and test it in a second population, okay? And this is, you know, it's, of course, it's a, it's a big improvement from this previous scenario, okay? Because now if the algorithm in this new population performs equally, uh, uh, you know, with equal accuracy than in the first population, then we are more confident that this is a, an algorithm that can be transferred into different settings, okay? And it's more robust. It performs better across multiple scenarios, okay? An even better setting could be, um, you know, in one population, you, you, you divide your, your sample in three, you have a, a training set, a validation set, and a test set, and you, you the first two, you iterate, it, iteratively improve your algorithm, then you test it, and then you finally take it to a completely separate population and do an external test, okay? And this is what, what happened in, um, in this study, it was published in, you know, first new year of 2020, okay? We didn't know anything about or not much about COVID in those days, no lockdowns yet. But it is this um, paper published in Nature 
out of the DeepMind group um, by Google. And it's this international evaluation of an AI system for breast cancer screening. So what they did was exactly what I, what I described here. The first population was a UK population and they, then they uh, took their algorithm and did an external test on US population, okay? So again, it's not like they went to a country that is completely different in terms of uh, demographics, but you know, fairly different in terms of demographics and they got pretty good results, okay? And here you can see, um, let me see if the annotation tool works. Um, so here you can see then this curve is how the algorithm performs. And over here, let me put it in, over here you can see this is a mean human radiologist, okay? And this is the best operating point for the AI system, the machine learning system. So you can see, you know, if you get closer to this ideal spot, you know, up here of the 100% sensitivity, 100% specificity, the closer to this spot that you get, the better. So this is, you can say, oh, this is better than the human reader, okay? This is better than the human reader. But I'm gonna bring you back to this plot that we saw before. But again, any thoughts about this? And again, I, I know I cannot interact with you with my with uh, you know live sound, uh, but think about it. Is this what patients care about? Being diagnosed with breast cancer. And this is even more controversial than what I said before about blood pressure. If people want to interact, they can, um, there's a chat function, so they can. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. I, I can see the Q&A and I have the chat open. So if you type anything in the Q&A or the chat, I'll be able to see it. Yeah. So I'm going to, I'm going to tolerate this silence <laughs> and do patients care about breast cancer being diagnosed with breast cancer in two years. Probably no, says Song Liang. What do you, and if you wanna interject, please go ahead. Why not? What do they care about? What should they care about? I mean, <laughs> there's many aspects. Um, so, so first, maybe I think what the patients really care about if they do have a cancer, they maybe care more about uh, the survival rate, five years mm -hmm. survival, um, and also what kind of uh, available medicine they have. I mean, if I really care about the early detection, the early diagnosis, uh, breast cancer in two years maybe is a bit too nearby, I maybe care more mm -hmm. about what, like the CBD cardiovascular risk factors let me know uh, the next 10, 20 years uh, of the risk factor, right? As mm -hmm. a more used for early diagnosis tool. Okay, yeah, absolutely. And Jackie says they might, if there's a treatment to help them at this early stage. And what do you mean? I'm gonna press you, Jackie. What do you mean by help them? Well, if they can find out that they're going to have breast cancer in two years. If there's something that they could do now, whether it's diet, lifestyle, or even a preventative treatment or medication, then they might they might care. But if there's nothing they can do, well, then they're just going to potentially be stressed for two years. But then I remember um, reading a paper even um, years ago, and it was about eyesight, and potentially people do care finding out if they're going to go blind in five years because there might be something they can do now and all the things they can do and travel that they might want to fit in now before they lose their sight. So I think it kind of depends on what's happening later and what mm -hmm. they do now to what are they going to do with that knowledge? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and that's, and what you said is extremely important. Like when you ask patients about losing their sight in five years, you know, there's stuff that maybe you, there's nothing you can do about the disease, but maybe they can see things, you know, they want to go and, you know, see the ocean or see the snow or go to the Taj Mahal, whatever. Um, so, so there's, that, that's 
why it's very important to have patience on the loop when we work with these systems, design these systems, because we that's they are the ones who define what's important. Because again, I'm gonna I'm gonna challenge this idea that you know being diagnosed with breast cancer is not the outcome. Um, the the they here Lena is very very you know on target with the question. They care about what the diagnostic means: premature death, uh, loss of eyesight, etc. So we care about if the algorithm is good for patients, my patients should live longer. My patients should have less years of disability. My uh, patients should, um, should be able to improve an outcome that they care about. But let's say if I, if I just label them as having a breast cancer, but that tumor was never gonna grow, never gonna invade, never gonna expand to other sites of their body, then maybe we don't care about the label of being diagnosed with breast cancer. And that, unfortunately, that's something that does happen with breast cancer. There's a, there's a significant portion of patients with low grade uh, breast cancer that get overdiagnosed. Okay. And remember the, you know, this example, if you get a ton of patients that are labeled now as having thyroid cancer, then um, we're doing them a disservice if, on the other hand, it doesn't come coupled with an improve in survival. And again, this is something that you need to, you know, burn into your retinas, into your brain. Accuracy is a surrogate outcome. Okay, um, I teach a, a subject of the semester that's uh, here at the university that's called. Um, machine learning applications for healthcare. And I have stickers with this that I give my students out so they can actually, you know, really, really learn that accuracy is a surrogate outcome. We don't really care about accuracy unless my patients are going to do better in the long run. Um, and here is another example. Uh, we need to be careful of biased outcomes because, again, again, increased survival, especially with machine learning, when we're talking about predicting things that are gonna happen in the future, uh, there's some tricky things that may, may, may happen. One of them is um, um, what we call lead time, okay? If, if you're not familiar with lead time, um, lead time is that when we do screenings is let's say there's uh, like prostate cancer, okay? There's, um, there's a time where I can do where I can do screening. Um, ideally, I'll detect the disease before the clinical symptoms appear and I can do something, um, but eventually maybe the patient might, might die of the disease, okay? So we call lead time, the time between screening and the time that the clinical symptoms appear, okay? Let's say I create an AI um, algorithm that takes, you know, an arbitrary uh, data set and can predict whether the patient is going to develop this disease. And by disease, I mean the clinical symptoms down the road. Um, and then what I'm doing is this, you know, I'm, in, I'm detecting the disease early or predicting the disease at this stage, you know, where I have the AI prediction that's earlier than what would have happened with the screening test. But the time where the clinical symptoms didn't really change, I couldn't do anything about it, okay? So in instead of having a patient and the, the time between clinical symptoms and death didn't really change. So I'm not improving survival. I'm not improving um, the, the time. Um, I'm not bringing forward the time that the clinical symptoms develop. I'm just making the time between that I know that the patient might develop the symptoms and the actual symptoms, I'm just making it longer. So I'm making the patient live longer with this sort of idea or knowledge that they're gonna develop this disease, okay? And now, and that's what happened with a lot of prostate screening uh, tests, which what they, they did not change the survival, they did not change the symptoms, they only changed the lead time. So they would diagnose patients earlier and they say, oh, after I'm diagnosed, 
with the, the screening test, patients are living 10 years and they used to live five years, okay? But the, the distance is not between the symptoms and death, it's between the test and death. So I'm just artificially increasing the time that they survive. And that's what we call lead time bias. And very, very linked to that is this problem of overdiagnosis. And this is what happened with, with thyroid cancer. Um, you have a screening test, a neck ultrasound. Patients are dying from other things. That's why we have unrelated death here. And then the clinical symptoms would have developed later on. So again, the lead time for these is even bigger, okay? Um, and I'm gonna answer that Lena, Lena's question uh, here. And if I, on top of that, I include an AI prediction that does it even sooner than the screening test, um, then, um, then that problem might be um, even bigger. And the question Lena has there is, I can see why increased lead time is not helpful in improving patient relevant outcomes, but I don't understand how it causes problem. And the problems of increased lead time, let me go back to this one, is that you have, um, you have patients, and, and it, might be, um, it might be neutral for some patients, but some patients really care about being labeled as sick or at risk of becoming sick. And um, let's say, for example, in prostate cancer, we know that a bunch of patients are never going to develop any symptoms. So they have a very long lead time. And if I make that even longer, okay, so um, if I make that even longer, you have a time where a patient might under treatment, you know, without having to, without having needed that treatment in the first place. Okay, and that treatment or procedures might include biopsies, might include surgeries. Um, we know that, for example, in prostate cancer, for every thousand patients that you screen uh, for, for uh, every year for 10 to 15 years, you're gonna reduce one patient from dying from prostate cancer, but you're gonna have a bunch of patients over-treated and you're gonna have a bunch of patients, about 200 for every thousand, you're gonna have um, an adverse event derived of that over-treatment. And you know, sometimes it's just a psychological burden of being labeled as at risk of having an, uh, uh, a future disease. Um, so again, key messages from here, this section, AI is not different from other interventions or innovations. The effects need to be clinically validated and we need to use patient relevant outcomes. And if we move on to this, the implementation, you know, first we define what we mean by implementation. Um, and it's this idea of an effective, sustain and embedded adoption of interventions by health systems and communities, by effective interventions by health systems and communities. Um, and, and we see the problem when we read um, some news articles that have been appearing lately. So we're in an implementation crisis of AI in healthcare. Um, this is a, an article by the MIT Technology Review, um, and it's from about a year ago, that they reported on uh, hundreds of AI tools have been built to catch COVID. None of them helped. Um, some have been used in hospitals despite not being properly tested, and, um, and a bunch of them were never, ever used. Here's a systematic review that was published uh, early in the year 2000. And it's a living systematic review. So it's been updated over and over again. And it says, till this day, this review indicates that almost all published prediction models are poorly reported and at high risk of bias, such that their reported predicted performance is probably optimistic, okay? 
until this day. So there were hundreds or even thousands of algorithms published that help you identify COVID from uh, chest x-rays that could predict you know, mortality out of those chest x-rays. But there was actually none of that or very little implemented. This is another example, um, external validation of a widely implemented proprietary sepsis prediction model in hospitalized patients. And this is a 2021 article in JAMA Internal Medicine out of the University of Michigan. And what they did is they took this sepsis prediction algorithm developed by a electronic health record company that has customers here in Australia, actually the Royal Melbourne Hospital, Peter Mac, Royal Children's and the women's here in Melbourne, they all use Epic. They don't use this algorithm as far as I can tell, but there were a lot of hospitals across the US and the world that were using this sepsis prediction algorithm. And they did this external validation and the performance was terrible. Okay. And the problem is with this final step, you know, there's three stages in the development of artificial intelligence technologies. Again, broadly speaking, you know, the data capture, cleaning, labeling, what we call the first mile. Then the second mile is building and testing your models. Uh, and then in this transition from the middle mile and the last mile is this idea of a clinical validation. But the last mile is the real world implementation and routine use. Okay, we haven't been able to cross yet with very, um, a lot of success this middle, middle mile to the last mile. But even if I had an algorithm that has de demonstrated to be clinically useful for patient relevant outcomes, then the implementation would still be, be a challenge. And we can see, I'm gonna go through a little bit of, of that. Again, the last mile is a challenge. So we can see that even if we have great ideas, um, there are multiple challenges that prevent them, uh, prevent me from bringing those ideas, you know, algorithms to the hospital. And a lot of them end up in the bin and never get implemented. There's problems around privacy with, you know, patient data. Um, the IT environment in hospitals is very, very complex. There's hospitals, they, they have this very, very evident tension between their need to innovate and their risk aversion. And when it comes to connecting an external AI or any information system into their electronic health records, there's this very, very risk you know, aversion attitude, which is understandable, okay? Um, then the problem of knowledge, sometimes, you know, clinicians and hospital administrators, even government funding agencies, they don't understand the power of these algorithms to improve healthcare outcomes. And finally is the funding. Usually, let's say I have a, I have a, um, an algorithm that is able to um, reduce the risk of hospital readmissions. Um, and the company charges me, let's say half a million dollars a year to use this algorithm in my, in my patients and provide real input into, into my electronic health record. Uh, who's gonna pay for that? Hospitals are not paid for that. Um, there's not a like an MBS item for AI algorithm predicting something. Um, we re we just recently got telehealth uh, MBS items where the you know the 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 barriers to to coming up with those MBS items was way way lower than 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 for these AI algorithms. So again, it's it's a it's a chicken or egg problem, and that's what I reflect there. Um, you know, hospitals say I won't implement it because you haven't validated it. And the, you know, whoever is developing the AI algorithm says I haven't validated because you won't let me implement it. And we have this chicken or egg problem. And what we're doing here at the University of Melbourne is trying to 
to create a parallel pipeline um, to what exists for the developing drugs and devices. When for drugs, devices, vaccines, you go from this process of discovery, development, then preclinical research, then clinical trials, regulatory agency review, and then funding decisions. But for digital health, and this includes AI algorithm, there's no such thing in the middle. So we have funding agencies that don't really know what to fund in this space. We have a lot of discovery and development at universities like, like, uh, like the University of Melbourne where I work, um, but some stuff in between is sort of very, very murky and it's hard to know how to navigate this. Um, so what can we do? Uh, we, we've started working on this idea that we call the digital health validatron, okay? Which again, seeks to be a bridge to close this gap that we see in developing uh, new drugs and, and devices, but for digital health. Um, and this digital health validatron tries to sit as a stage before going into the hospital. Um, I used to work as the chief medical information officer for a hospital a few years ago. And every week I would receive some researcher or one, uh, some startup company coming with their product or, or their idea and they wanted to test it in our hospital. And again, I had the chicken or egg conversation with them. So what we're doing here with this digital health validatron is setting up infrastructure and processes to allow innovators to bring their innovations and understand and design what are the best clinical workflows to connect this algorithm to the healthcare system. For example, the same uh, example that I gave, if I took an AI algorithm that can uh, predict the risk of being readmitted to the hospital, there are many ways that I can implement that in my hospital. I could you know, read the data every night and I don't know, print out a report the next day flagging all the patients that are at increased risk um, of, uh, of hospital readmission. So I need to be aware when I discharge them or the algorithm could real data in real time and send a text message to the treating doctor uh, about this, or it could send a message uh, through a smartphone app to the treating nurse, or you know, multiple different options. So again, one same algorithm could have different avenues to be in, to being implemented. So what we're doing here is creating a, a lab with all the different pieces. You know, hopefully you're seeing Lego pieces that are moving around. So we have a digital sandbox that has um, a simulated hospital EHR, a simulated GP electronic health record, a simulated tel telehealth client, a secure messaging platform. It has a clinician dashboard, patient facing app, and we can combine these in arbitrary forms to represent the most viable clinical workflows. And then we have a simulation lab here in Melbourne Connect, um, in, in the Parkville precinct here in Melbourne, where we have this digital health validatron sim lab, where we have uh, a GP office, we have a hospital bed, we have a patient home simulated where we can actually test these workflows. So we create the workflows with patients, with clinicians, then we have all the digital tools to make these, these workflows actually a reality. And then we can test them in the sim lab and we can go back to the hospitals and tell them, hey, you know what? We have this algorithm. We've, this is the workflow that makes sense for clinicians in your health service. This is the workflow that makes sense for patients. We've actually tested it with different digital components and it actually works. Let's do a randomized trial, okay? And so now we have, you know, happy researchers, happy health services, happy patients and, and, and developers, because we have a way to start closing this gap and have, you know, the preclinical research in the lab. We can start thinking about doing 
research, uh, you know, clinical trials and talk to regulatory agencies and hopefully in the future make funding decisions about all this and hopefully lead to, you know, an accelerated implementation. So again, final messages for all of you today. Oh, I know we have a few minutes left. Validation is about patient relevant outcomes. Accuracy is important, but it's just a surrogate outcome. It doesn't uh, complete the, the validation of a digital algorithm and implementation is hard. And we're doing some things, not everything, but we're doing some things that help uh, innovators translate their findings into, into patient care uh, quicker. And with that, I would like to thank everyone. Uh, there you have my email address, my Twitter account, the Twitter account of our center. It's at DT for health, digital transformation for help. And that's, um, that's all I had to tell you today. And I'm happy to take, uh, to take questions. Thank you so much for your talk. That's, um, that was really easy to follow and um, really, really informative. I'll wait a second and see if anyone's got any questions. Mm -hmm. While we're waiting, I suppose while I was listening, I was just thinking, um, what was I thinking? Um, there's obviously a lot of challenges with like medi medications and drugs and things and they come across, um, obviously trials would be hard with that. Do you think artificial intelligence trials um, like you said, that the hospitals and things say no to doing the trials in them. Do you think that's because they are scared of the privacy and things and bringing that in there? Do you think it's harder than than drug trials, or do you just think it faces its own problems? So I think I think it has its own problems because uh, so right now nobody's going to approve a drug without trials behind it. Um, but regulators haven't yet defined what does an AI algorithm need to demonstrate to be able to get approval. You know, in Australia, the TGA hasn't decided what it's gonna do about algorithms or whether it needs to approve them. The FDA in the US has sort of hinted that there might be some regulatory requirements coming down the pipeline, but there's nothing really, um, in, you know, preventing us. Like the EPIC algorithm that I just described, it has never gone through any kind of approval. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, we have, you know, drug companies and, and clinical research organizations, they have a very well-polished way of create, you know, running clinical trials. Why? Because the regulator requires them to do that. We don't have that in digital health yet. So I think it's something that we need to be ready for because it's, we're seeing signs that it may be coming and that's, that's uh, and we need to be ready. And at least our work in the digital health editatron is something that we're trying to to do to be ready for that, for when that time comes. And of course, not every algorithm is gonna need uh, approval, but it's gonna be a risk base. If I'm, if I'm generating you know, uh, an AI algorithm that recommends the type of, and I'm gonna just say something, maybe it's a dumb thing, but you know, it, 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 it can re forecast the weather and tells me what the, what's the best exercise that I could do. Should I, should I go out for a run or do a treadmill or do yoga exercises at home? Maybe that doesn't need to be regulated because okay, so there's a human you know, making that final decision whether I go uh, for a run or not. But if you're gonna uh, you know, predict which patients are gonna develop um, sudden death 10 years down the road, which there are papers doing that being published, what do you do with that information. If I tell you, hey, you're at risk of sudden death 10 years down the road, that's a pretty heavy prognosis to make. Um, and, and of course that needs a different kind of regulation. Um, I think when that comes, I think hospitals are very good at, uh, at running clinical trials. We don't, we don't have streamlined ways of communicating with our electronic health records yet. Um, there are some uh, APIs, application programming interfaces that are, going, are being mandated for electronic health records in the US. That might help us uh, sort of intervene or um, intervene our electronic health records to allow us to, to uh, run those trials. But I think we're not there yet. 
it's coming, but it's we're not there yet. I'll ask another question. We'll see mm -hmm. if anyone's got one. Um, can any can anyone like with your Valatron, um, do you encourage anyone with artificial intelligence? Um, obviously it needs to match with what like you've got patient data and things that you're working with, but do you encourage um anyone with the that needs access to like if they want to go into hospital to go through Valatron? Like is that open to anyone or who's that kind of who you so it's we we're having open conversations with anyone um we right now most of our um our studies have been digital health innovations that are not ai based mm -hmm. so we'd be happy to discuss you know if you have an ai based intervention uh, that you want to bring to the healthcare system we'd be happy to have that discussion right now we've been working with different clinicians and their digital health innovations. And we've been uh, seeking grant funding. So most of our funding comes from the MRFF. Mm -hmm. And we've been, but so we would need to figure out what's the best way to fund that piece of work. We don't have like unlimited funds to, to get that work done, but we, we could work together and apply for grants. Um, and, and, and in that way we could, we could you know, validate uh, in the lab the operation of a digital health uh, algorithm based on AI. Yeah, that's that's definitely. So if you have something and you want to discuss, you know, write me an email and we can set up set something up. Yeah, awesome. Um, while we are at six, I think I, I just have one question about accuracy. This might be unless someone else has another one. Um, <laughs> I suppose even with what we've been running in um, our AI trials doctors everyone like the clinicians tend to really focus on the accuracy and I suppose from your talk you you definitely I, I assume accuracy is still important but what you're saying is you might get this result but what are you going to do with it or is it any value to the person is that kind mm -hmm. of um yep, so and sure, yeah how do you kind of deal with those two things because on one hand you're getting asked I don't want to talk to you until the accuracy and then it's kind of like well what do we do with it so it's probably both, you know, if the system is inaccurate, then there's not much you can do about it. Yeah. So I think accuracy is important, but it's not the end goal. Mm -hmm. um, that's probably the message. Um, and if we see the same thing with diagnostic tests that are not AI based, like lab tests, pathology tests, imaging, you know, in, in medical school, they teach you, oh, this is the sensitivity, this is a specificity, but the, the number of, of clinical trials of diagnostic strategies is very, very, very small. I think that's a big gap in knowledge that we have in clinical medicine, not just in AI, for all other uh, you know, diagnostic tests, even physical findings, you know, physical findings. I remember, you know, I don't know, when, when they were teaching you about deep venous thrombosis in the you know, lower leg, they would teach you all the signs and symptoms and so on. Somebody at some point did a systematic review and found that half of what they were teaching you was crap. Um, and so um, in terms of its ability to predict the, you know, the, the future appearance of the disease or the, the presence of the disease. So again, we, we have this big gap in knowledge in all sorts of diagnostic strategies. And I think that we just added AI to that pile of stuff that we don't know. Yeah. So I suppose having the AI and being accurate, but bringing it in with how you can actually utilize it and having it to aid the care is probably as, as important. As, as important, yes. Yeah. Awesome. Well, I think I've asked all my questions. All right. <laughs> um, I don't know if no one's... Um, no one's put their hand up or asked anything there. Um, so I might I might end it there if that's okay. Um, but thank you so much for your talk um, talk tonight. And um, yeah, like I said, it was really informative and it was, yeah, it was really interesting to, to <laughs> see that side of um, artificial intelligence. All right. Thank you so much for the, again, for the invitation. Uh, and again, we have at the Center for Digital Transformation of Health, we have lots of opportunities. We have a short course in learning health system that you know walks us through the whole process of under generating insights from data and then designing interventions based on that. Uh, we are starting again this, this subject on applied machine learning for healthcare. 
Um, we're open to supervising PhD students, master's students, uh, applying for grants together. So shoot us an email if you have an idea. We can, you know, make things work. Perfect. Um, All right. Thank you so much. Well, thanks everyone that um, tuned in tonight as well. All right. All thank right. You. Thank you. Bye. Bye.